How many of you guys know we are in a battle? We're in a series now. This is part two in the series, Winning the War When You're Under Attack. Don't be mistaken that when it feels like all hell is coming against your life and, and you just feel like your world is caving in, it may very well be an attack of the enemy. It could be that you're being tested. It could be a result of sin in your life because sin brings destruction and eventually brings death. But it very well could be an attack of the enemy because Satan's job is to test us for weakness continually because he wants you to eventually die spiritually. They say that the high ground is best. And you know, I experienced that myself when I was in a battle of paintball. And I'll tell you, I'll never forget this. This was the first time I'd ever played paintball. And I was really, I was kind of apprehensive about it because I don't like pain very much, even though I'm a ninja. And, and my strategy in being a ninja is to be so quick that I never get touched, right? Like, for instance, did you see that? You see? It's pretty quick because you can't even see it happen. But, but I just touched every one of your noses throughout the whole sanctuary, and you didn't even see it because I'm a ninja. So when I was playing paintball that day, right, we're out in this paintball course, and always, this is just a tip, always, always look out for the 14-year-old boy that shows up with the nicest equipment and doesn't say one word, but sticks really to himself and shows up alone. Watch out for that dude. When his mom drops him off, and he's got all the nicest gear, and he doesn't say anything to anybody, he's like, he's not here to make friends, guys. The dude is nuts, all right? This is all he does. This is all he thinks about. When he's not playing it on the field, he's probably playing it on some sort of video game in a dark basement in his house and only comes up to eat. You know what I'm saying? So we were in the midst of a very, very heavy attack. And if I recall, it was all of us against this kid. And this kid was nutso. And he had taken the high point in this tower and nobody could pick him off. But of course, me being the ninja, I had a strategy, right? Ninja with a gun, you can't take out a ninja with a gun, right? So I made my way into the lower level of the building right next to him. And he was sniper mode in the top of the tower right next to this building. So I, I, I'm like belly crawling with finesse and ease, total and complete. You know, I had all the right, I was like a cat. And so I, I, I crawled into this lower building, all right, and, I, and I'm, I'm creeping up, I'm standing up right next to this window, and I can see the sniper at the top of the tower right next to me, right? So then I hear a whistle blow, and some idiot referee, right, walks over and says, oh, I think, you know, he's, you know, this guy, he's underpaid and got way too much pride, and he says, I think I saw some paint on your gun. Let me check your barrel, please. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I'm showing him, you know, the, the edge of my barrel. I was like, all right, there's no paint. It just must have been like sunshine reflecting off your barrel. Okay, continue. And he turns around and zap! I get, I get hammered in the neck in my Adam's apple. Hits me right in the throat with the sniper paintball. And then he gives me a thumbs up. And he goes, okay, like, you're totally out, okay? Because I saw that. You're out. I'm like, okay, I hate you, first of all. You're a very, very bad referee. And, that, and, and second, that's not fair because you stopped. I was about to take him out. He stopped the game, right? And the, how many of you guys, let's take a poll. How many of you guys think that was fair? Is that really, if you raise your hand, if you, th you think that was fair? How many think life is not fair? That was that's not we fair. You children, can't Brad. stop the match and then just turn around and it's, he just turned around. Game on, I get taken out in the throat. So then I fell onto the ground and started sucking my thumb in the fetal position and called for Misty. I said, honey, I might be out of the match. You take him out. Whatever it takes, take that kid off the tower. And if I recall, the kid beat everybody. Uh, so anyway, positioning in battle is everything. He knew exactly. How many of you guys have ever played basketball before? You play basketball? Barely. Same thing. In basketball, if you are an athlete and you know what it means to take a charge, if your feet aren't set and you're not in the right position when you're literally trying to get knocked over, I mean, that is the entire point of taking a charge in basketball. And your coach and your referees will tell you if you're not set in the right position when you get slammed to the ground, and some guys are awesome at faking it, like they make it look awesome because they want to get that charge called on the other guy. But if you're not in the right position, all you're going to get to do is get hammered. 
Just like Brad thought he was in the right position, he was not. The kid, the 14-year-old, was way smarter, had thought it out. He was in the right Wait a minute. He may have been more experienced and a cheater and in courts <laughs> with the ref, dude. But his positioning was better, I'll admit that. He just beat me to the top of the tower first. Position truly is everything. Maybe you've seen that old movie, Swiss Family Robertson. You ever heard of that? Like, growing up, I don't know, we were nerds. We liked that. That was like a battle movie I could handle. Because Some of real, us never change. Real battle movies, I don't like. I don't like all the killing. But that one's cool. And I remember this part on it where... Um, you know, they get they get shipwrecked onto this island, and it's their family, and they become these awesome survivors. And all of a sudden, pirates find them. And when they see the pirates coming, they begin to get this strategy and this battle plan together. And so the dad and the boys and the mom and all of them get together, and they decide that they're going to go up on this high mountain, and they're going to set all these booby traps all the way down. So that when the pirates come onto the land and they come to get them, they're going to have to go up this mountain, and as they do, they're going to be on the top picking them off one by one with all these crazy, awesome booby traps. That was a good movie. And because of their positioning up here on the mountaintop, they literally took out all the pirates until they just began to run back out to sea, scared with their, their tail between their legs. And in the same way, in the spiritual battle that we are in, we have to be in right positioning with God in order to win this battle. If you try to get in this battle and you try to take it any other way, you're going to find yourself just like the guy who gets hammered um, playing basketball or just like Brad getting popped off and honestly came home with the biggest whelp you've ever seen in your life right here on his neck. I don't know why that happened. I'm sorry. I happened. need to move past it. I'm sorry. You do. You need this to get over it and get some fair. forgiveness. If you've got your word, we're going to talk about right positioning today in part two. Go to Ephesians chapter six. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Who are we going to be strong in? Well, you guys are boring. Who are we going to be strong in? Thank you. In the Lord, not in ourselves, not in our own abilities, but in the Lord and in the power of his might. We're going to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, that is the strategies, the tactics, or the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against one another, even though you think it is, Brad. Your spouse is not your enemy. Your coworker is not your enemy. We battle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. As we talked about last week, we really dove into who the enemy is. See, our enemy is not flesh. It's not the kid that's from the creepy basement playing paintball. It's not your spouse. It's not the person next to you driving you crazy in traffic. And just speaking of traffic, just, what was that, Thursday night, as we're driving in traffic, just minding our own business, trying to do what's right, we get rear-ended in Miami. Just bam, right out into the street. Now, luckily, we're all fine, except for maybe a twitch or two. But our boys had never been in an accident, and you begin to realize in that moment how thankful you are that God is always on your side, that angels are always surrounding you. Because in that moment, we could have jumped out of that car, and I can only imagine what the guy expected. You know, when he hit us, when we stepped out, if you were walking in the flesh, you'd step out and probably not be nearly as nice as we were. We were saying, are you okay? You know, to the guy and his eyes swelling shut. And he's probably expecting, because I hit someone in college one time, and the guy that got out on the other, uh, the other end of that vehicle started chewing me up one side and down the other until I was like, you know, you are not a very nice person. <laughs> I didn't even know what to say. I mean, the cop came, and I'm like, wow, the dude didn't have his blinker on. That's not nice at all. Misty's a little too nice. I mean, when road rage happens, you know, she's just are you okay? It was all over. I took the guy's information and we're like, it's okay. Go into the hospital. Like, we're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You yeah, get out of here. Good. We're Christians. We're not going to sue you or anything like that. And AJ's like, why not? We could totally. Like, like, I could buy a four-wheeler. Sue him. <laughs> my like, neck is son. hurting. Isn't this reason for a suit? It's like, no. He's like, I don't know about you guys. My neck hurts. <laughs> He's been complaining. But see, our battle's not against one another. And we have got to begin to realize that. John 10 and 10 tells us this. The thief comes except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life yes. and have it more 
abundantly. Yeah. Today, as we look at right positioning, we're going to talk about two different things. It's going to be very easy to remember. The first thing is based on 10 and 10, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for my life. But at the same time, Satan also has a plan for your life. We talked about the fact that he was cast out of heaven because of his pride. And because of that, he hates anyone who has a relationship with God. And he wants to utterly and completely destroy us. The Bible says that God has, God wants us to have an abundant life. Can you hold that for me? That'd be awesome. I can. And abundant literally means this. Abundant means beyond what is anticipated, exceeding expectation and going past the expected limit. How many of you guys would like to have an abundant life? When you think about the fact that God wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ever ask and even think. You see, when we're kids, we dream what kind of life we would like to have. We think about what would be the coolest career. We think about what would be the coolest homes, cars, all of these things. And yet, God already had it all laid out. He has a destiny for each and every one of our lives. And when the Bible says that he wants us to have an abundant life, he wants us to have the exceedingly abundant life. That we are to seek first the kingdom of God above everything else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. See, we get it really mixed up down here. A lot of times what we do is we seek everything else, and we put God way back here on a back burner. And we know he's there. It's kind of like putting him in our back pocket. It's like, I got God with me. He's right here in my hip pocket. If I need him, I'll pull him out like he's a little genie in the bottle. And we'll ask him for things. But until then, I'm going to leave him right there. And see, the word of God makes it very clear. If we want to be in right positioning, then it takes us seeking first the kingdom of God. Seeking first living righteously. Living in right positioning with God. See, when we live righteously, it's like when you go out and you target practice and you're literally trying to hit what? The bullseye. If you're trying to live righteously every day of your life, it's like you imagine that you are trying with your life to hit the bullseye. One of my favorite scriptures in Psalms 5, it tells us this. It says, surely the Lord will bless the righteous. He will surround them with favor as a shield. What God blesses you with, it's favor. That means God goes before you. His favor goes before you as a shield. He already sees what's about to happen. When we got in that accident, God already knew someone was going to run into the back of our car that night. God already knew that. He already had his angels surrounding us. God already knew what bills are coming in the mail this week. God already knows what the doctor is going to say to you this week. God already knows. And if you're in the right position, then God's favor goes before you. And I'm not saying bad things don't ever happen. They do. But God gives you the peace to be able to handle it when its favor is going before you. If I stay in the right position, then God's favor is in front and God's glory is behind how can I lose? I'm surrounded by God's presence. But see, the problem is so often we don't get in the right position because we're seeking after the wrong thing. So we're over here doing our own thing when the right position is right here. The right position is making sure that you start your day every day in God's word. The right position is making sure that you start your day every day on your knees, making sure that you have communication, you have a relationship. How many of you guys have ever been married and you weren't even talking to your spouse, right? Don't raise your hand. We'll do counseling later. You know, you're not even talking and all of a sudden one of you needs something from the other one. And so it's like, oh man, how do I go and ask for something, right? Because we're not even speaking. And so then you have to go ask and the other one's like, I'm not helping you. Why would I help you? You know, I'm not going to help you. You haven't even talked to me in days. I don't even know you. I don't even know you. Who are you? Right? Why? Because you don't have much of a relationship unless you're talking to someone. You don't have much of a relationship unless you are listening to someone. Because that's what God wants out of each and every one of us. And it takes you getting in that right position. But at the same time, the same scripture tells us that although God has a plan for you to have abundant life, Satan also has a plan. So the whole time you are trying to hit this target right here, Satan is also out, and he's trying to get you to completely and totally miss. He's trying to get you to miss the mark. We aim towards right positioning continually. 
so that we can be focused on who God has called us to be. And Satan's job is to distract us. He has many different ways of trying to get us from hitting the mark. And the word sin is, this really doesn't benefit you very much, but it's hamartia, and it means to miss the mark. Literally, to miss the bullseye, because the opposite of sin is righteousness. When you want to be in right positioning with God, you're aiming towards that target. You're seeking first the kingdom of God and his right positioning, knowing that all of the things that are most important in your life, God is going to make it all fall into place. But Satan knows if he can get you to miss the target, then he knows you're not going to be in the favor and in the right positioning with God. He knows that God can't bless you. God can't give you that abundant life. But most importantly to Satan, he knows that sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And his desire is to steal, kill, and destroy. And we hear about that when we see the, the, the fiery darts of the wicked one coming towards us. And they, as we spoke about in, in part one, those darts, when they penetrate, when they hit us, they're on fire and they consume us and they destroy our lives. So, so how does Satan do this? How, how does he try to attack our lives? We know that Satan isn't everywhere at once. But we also know that he has a whole horde or an army of demons that have different levels of leadership throughout the kingdom. Now that sounds really sci-fi and really crazy, but it's so unbelievably true that Satan can't do it all because he's only one individual. So he has all these demons, just like there's angels assigned to our lives, there's demons assigned to your life, believe it or not. But his target is our mind. He's constantly, continually trying to tempt us and sow lies and fears into our mind. Another way that he attacks us is through oppression. Now, oppression is when you get attacked from the, from the outside. So Satan is attacking you from the outside. Maybe that can come in different ways. Maybe he can... I'm going to read some of these off to you, and if you're taking notes, these are really, really good. But maybe he brings affliction into your life and to inflict something hard or to cause you to endure something very, very difficult. He might harass you. Now think of all these things. I want to relay this portion or these examples to when the Bible talks about how though we may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because a shadow can't hurt us. But we feel like we're about to be consumed. We feel like the, the things that are most precious to us are being stolen from us. We feel like we're being destroyed because Satan is a liar and from the outside really tries to convince you that your whole world is falling apart. But what you need to do is keep your eyes, keep your mind on the target. So he brings affliction. He'll harass you. He'll influence you. And this really means to exercise indirect power over you in order to sway or affect you in some way. He tries to influence you to kind of just turn direction and turn away from God. Uh, he tries to torment you. He tries to torture you. He tries to put worry or fear in your heart. Worry is the opposite of faith because worry just breeds fear and fear is the opposite of faith. So when we begin to worry about things, when those thoughts come into your mind, oh, you know, you're just, you're, your, your child is not going to recover. They're, they're so sick. You're going to lose your job. You know, uh, you're going to get cancer. You know, uh, you're going to go find it. You're going to be so broke. You're going to have to file bankruptcy. I mean, over and over and over with every area of life, you can just see how Satan begins to sow these lies into your mind. But we're not to believe those lies. We're to believe the truth of God. So worry is the opposite of, of faith because the Bible says that, that when, we, when we don't have faith in God, that it's literally like we are spitting in God's face. It's, it's, it's literally like witchcraft that we're performing in our lives when we worry or we doubt or we fear. We're saying, God, I don't believe you are who you say you are, and I don't believe you can do what you say you can do in my life. So we have to be so careful. I, in fact, Misty and I have been really, really intentional in our lives about doing away with excluding the word worry from our vocabulary. We replace it with the word concerned. Because you can be concerned about something and devote it to prayer, right? But you can't really worry about something and, and have a good conscience about it because what you're saying is, I don't trust God. My favorite passage of Scripture you know, that's probably a lie because I have like 10 favorite passages. But one of my top, top favorites is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, 
but in all your ways, in all your ways of thinking, in everything you put your hands to, believe and trust that God can do it. And the word says he will direct your path. If you'll trust in him as your compass and as your guide and as your provider, you cannot go wrong. So when you have that kind of a focus and you're, you're honed in on the target and your right positioning is all you're concerned about, I'm telling you, you cannot go wrong. That's what right positioning is. It all comes back. This message is all about right positioning. If you want to stand the high ground, if you want to have the advantage, if you want to be able to stand firm and have the enemy flee from you, then you've got to keep your eyes on the target and don't lose hope. Misty, what happens here when the enemy tries to put a hit on our head? I don't know that I can make it stick here, but I um, want you to imagine. What are you doing? Don't lick it. Don't lick it. Ew. Don't lick it. Don't lick it. I want don't you to imagine it. with me that at the same time you are trying to hit the target, that we told you last week that the moment you accept Christ into your life, you have a hit on your head. And so I wanted you to get this visual in your mind that literally, although we don't see it every day. How did I get this job? I know, because it just looks better on you than on me. But we all have it. You just hold it there. There we go. Every day while you're trying, while you're trying to hit this target, okay? The enemy has this target that he's aiming at every single day. And so imagine that while Brad is literally trying to aim and trying to focus on a target, that the enemy is hurling darts at his head. You see, the Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, next week, we're going to go into what the shield of faith is. But I want you to understand and I honestly debated having fiery darts in here today, okay? But I thought I'll set yeah, off but the fire alarm. Last time we did the incense over Christmas I time, know. we burned the carpet. I burned the carpet, and I set off the fire alarm. So, and I made people sick. Yeah, so, people were like, oh, I can't breathe. I'm like, you're so dramatic. Get I, over it. Come on. Man, it's an illustration. It's an illustration people. So instead, I'm just going to show you what I want you to imagine. A fiery dart was literally, it was an arrow. At the end of it, there was like material, okay, that was wadded up, that was extremely flammable. They lit it on fire, literally, in the Roman war times, and they would have hurled those darts at one another. What do you think fire does? When you set something on fire, you intend to do what with it? You intend to burn it. You intend to destroy it right? A fiery dart is being sent at you because Satan is trying to destroy you. And so I want you to imagine that as you're trying to focus every day, you're trying to read your word. And while you're reading your word, you just can't focus, can you? You get so distracted. And as you're trying to pray, you just have all these thoughts like, I really need to get up and go do this. I really need to go do this. Oh, here comes the kids. I need to get up. Heaven forbid your children see you on your knees praying. Mine come in and they go, Shh, mom's praying. Go back out. You know, or I'll be like, you can come pray with me because your kids need to see you. But the enemy, every time you're trying to do something to stay focused, he's hurling these fiery darts at you. And the moment you get distracted and you're like, well, yeah, I'll come back to that later. And you get up and you go on out. Oh, somebody just posted on Facebook. Oh, i got to see what that is. And the next thing you know, you're scrolling down Facebook, and you totally forgot. And you're like, oh, man, I'm out of time. Now i got to go. I'll just pray in the car. And off you go. And you think it's so innocent. What is the big deal? So I get distracted when I read my words. So I get distracted when I pray. What's the big deal? The big deal is, is that while you're trying to arm yourself and get yourself in the right position, Satan is distracting you with the littlest of things. And then when you get up and you run off, he sits back and he laughs. Because he knows that you are not in the right position to handle what's going to happen to you that day. You see, if you've been in your word and you've read those passages of scripture that tells you, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. When you get out there today and work begins to get tough and you begin to wonder, what am I doing, man? Well, where am I going to go from here? Things begin to happen. You don't understand. You can go back and remember what you just read. You can go back and you can say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God, I know that you've got this. God, I trust in you. God, I'm just going to walk in peace because you're in the right position. But if you don't have any of this on the inside of you, guess what begins to happen? Your stomach begins to hurt. You begin to get headaches. You begin to get stressed out. You begin to get irritable and irritated. And people begin to talk to you and you start snapping at people. And you start getting nasty with people. And the whole time the enemy is like, I'm going to take you out. 
I'm going to destroy your life. I'm making you miserable. I'm making your relationships miserable. I am out to steal, kill, and destroy you. And it's all because you're not in the right position. Because favor is never going to go before you and God's glory is never going to come around behind you if you don't get in position. And I'm here to tell you, it's simple. It's take time every day to read God's word. And don't just read it to say you did it. Read it and get something out of it. If all you can handle is one verse because you can only digest that, then memorize one verse. If you can take in more, take in more. Then get on your knees and seriously ask God to help you that day. Seriously seek the face of God. And as you begin to do that, you'll begin to see your life just start to work. You'll begin to just feel peace. You'll begin to just see relationships start to be mended that weren't mended before. You'll begin to see things just falling into place. You'll begin to see checks coming in the mail when you didn't have the money to pay the bills. You'll begin to see a favor with your boss and God opening new doors, all because you got yourself in the right position so that you could live the exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or even think kind of life. Positioning is so powerful. And there's many things. Yes, reading your word every morning before you do anything else is powerful positioning. Praying with your spouse, with your children is powerful positioning every day. When you pay your tithe right off the top and you don't even consider any of those bills that need to be paid, that's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's putting your, your, your money where your faith is, <laughs> your faith where your money is. That's seeking first God's kingdom. But, but when people start to miss, you know, they say average uh, attendance in churches today, we're, we're, we're really seeing a rapid decline in church attendance. And, and the average church attender, help me out, was it once or twice a month? Once or twice a month, 15 times a year is the average 15 church times now. a year. And, and, and they're so in our culture, there's this sort of mentality or thinking that as long as I'm going consistently, if I'm going once a month, then, then I'm faithfully attending church. But let me tell you what you're not faithfully going to see. You're not going to faithfully see yourself being built up spiritually. You're not going to see yourself continually surrounded with the accountability and the encouragement and the relationships that you need to be on your A-game spiritually. You're not going to be fed and nurtured weekly like like. We, that, that is like one of the biggest things. When you come to God's house, you can be inspired and encouraged. And I want to tell you, if there's any one thing that you can do, I mean, yes, God's word is powerful. Prayer is powerful. But if we're going to take baby steps, be in God's house every single time the doors are open and everything else is just going to fall into place. Just for example, uh, Clayton and Shelby, um, they just... When, when, they, when they began to visit Mount Movers Church, they just made a decision that they, were, they just weren't going to miss. They, they said, you know, we're going to do this. And, and in their life at that time, man, they were, they were still in it. You know, they, they were in the world. Man, they were, they were living it up and they were having fun. And they were doing all these things just like most of us were doing that just their lifestyle displeased God. But they said, you know what, we're just going to take baby steps and we're just going to make the decision that... that we're just going to be in God's house. We're not going to let anything distract us from doing that. And since then, let me tell you how God has changed their lives, all right? They have, they have maybe missed, I think they've only missed one Sunday, but they may have missed if perfect attendance. I mean, I, I mean, seriously, but look at how God has blessed their lives because of it. I'm telling you, since then, God has blessed them with a house. God has given them a, a new car. I'm, did you hear me say give? They were given a car. He has been given a new job. And, and, and listen, listen, like God, I'm not going to be specific, but, but, but his income has doubled. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right positioning with God. Have there been hard times since they began? Absolutely. But they have kept their eyes on the target. They have continued to put God first. They haven't missed a Sunday. They've been in the Word. They pray together. Sometimes maybe they miss. Sometimes Misty and I miss praying together. But when you fall down, get up and keep your eyes on the target and don't stop. Don't stop. Keep your eyes on Christ. And the Word says that all of these things that are really important to you, I'm going to make those things important to me. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
Satan wants to get you off track. And, and the, the most common thing that we hear as pastors, for people, when we see people's lives falling apart, my question is, hey, we've really missed you in church lately. You know what's going on? Well, pastor, we've just been really busy. And it grieves my heart because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, can't you see how Satan is, is like you're on this, on this, on this tightrope and he's just pushing you off? And you're letting him. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you to tell you, look, you have available to you everything you need to have the favor of God and the blessings of God on your life. All you have to do is be faithful to his house and to his word and to his presence. And I want to encourage you today to do that. Yesterday, I was in prayer with Misty, and, and we were just praying together. And, and it's like God just spoke to me so strongly. And he said, I heard God whisper to me, Brad, why even ask for anything else? And he said, look up. And I looked up and I saw this beautiful woman. And he said, did you hear what I said? Yeah, God. He said, why ask for anything else? He said, look at the miracle. Look at the gift that I have given you. Look at this woman. And I began to think about her and just began to think about her beauty on the outside and her beauty on the inside and her commitment to God's kingdom and her how awesome of a mother she is and how hard she works and how diligent she is and how disciplined she is and how encouraging she is. And I just began to think and just, wow, God, what a gift. If that's all you ever gave me next to my salvation, why could I find myself even asking for any, I, I need nothing else. I'm set. And the reason I tell you that is, is to try to convey to you that positioning is priceless. The reason I've been blessed with this woman is because I have kept my eyes on God since the day I got saved. Have I made mistakes along the journey? Yeah, I've, I've, I've made some big mistakes. But I have got back up and kept my eyes on the prize, on Christ Jesus. And look at how he's blessed me. And I know there's many of you that can say the same thing in your life. I've kept my eyes. I've kept my focus on Christ. And look at how he's blessed my life. Couldn't ask for a more wonderful woman. I want to tell you guys today, I want to encourage you and challenge you before we pray. Don't settle for less than God's best. And don't get distracted. Make the house of God your focus. Make the people of God your focus. Make his word and prayer your focus. Make tithing your focus. Put God first. My life has been different. I wake up every morning and I pray and I have something to look forward to every day because I've been given another chance or another, another day to step forward in life and make things that I've done wrong in the past better and different. Um, me and my daughter have gotten closer, which is the main reason why I wanted God in my life because she had God in her life and I knew how she talked about him and how it was good for her and there's no way it could have been wrong for me. So I took that step and life has been great now. Me and her get along so much better. It's a slow process, but of course it's going to be. Life is good. I wake up every day and I'm happy and so I have something to look forward to as far as changing things go. I'm ready to give myself completely and totally to God. I'm ready to show God that I'm 100% behind this commitment. I want to show everyone that's here watching that I'm behind this commitment 100%. And I come back here, I go to a church in, in Decatur, Alabama called Epic, which is a great church. It reminds me a lot of this church, but I found God here in this church. God entered my heart here in this church. And I know it would have been the same if I would have done it in Decatur where I live, but it wouldn't have been the same to me. He's the reason why we're doing this baptism today. Because he told us that I'm going to be up there over the weekend and you're going to baptize me. Amen. So we're going to do it in the life and we're really excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of profession of your faith. We're baptizing you, Father, Son,
Making that decision to follow Christ, to make him the very center of your life, is the most important decision you can ever, ever think about making. And I want to give you an opportunity right now. You might say, Pastor Brad, you know, I just, I, I realize, I've come to a point in my life where I realize that I don't have the peace and the hope and the joy that I see believers, Christians having, and I want to have that same thing. And make Christ your very best friend. Invite him into your heart. Will you pray with me right now? Father, we are just so, so in love with you and so thankful, God, that and that you have given us your son, Jesus, and, and that you're so willing and so quick to forgive us of our shortcomings, so quick to forgive us of our mistakes, the things that we've said, the thoughts we've had, the things we've done. Uh, and and we've, we've fallen short in so many ways, God. We've sinned against you and against your word. And I just pray right now, Father God, that you would forgive me of those things that I've done. And I pray that you would make me new, just like your word says. God, I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I believe he's the king of kings. I confess with my mouth, Lord, that, that Jesus is Lord, that he's king. And I dedicate from this moment forward that I'm going to live for him. I, I invite Jesus into my life, into my heart, into my mind, into my actions, into my attitude. Each and every day and every way that Christ would, would just infiltrate, infuse me with his, his character and his power and his love. And Father, I just, I thank you so much for what you're going to do in my life. God, this is a brand new day. This is the day you've made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And I just pray right now that you would help me, God, to find a church that, that is going to come around me and just support me and encourage me to, to do my, my ministry and to find my calling in you. And, uh, and I'm believing you for it today, Father God. I thank you so much, God, for what you've done in my life, never to be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen.